Hello and welcome to the Spark of Ages podcast. I'm your host, Rajiv Parikh. I'm the CEO and founder of Position Square, an awesome growth marketing company based in Silicon Valley. So yes, I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, but I'm also a business news junkie and a history nerd. I'm fascinated by how big world-changing movements go from the spark of an idea to an innovation that reshapes our lives. If you like what you hear, please take a moment to rate it. Your feedback is what drives our show, so take 30 seconds and say hello. This is the Spark of Ages podcast. In addition to myself, we have our producer, Sandeep, who's occasionally going to chime in to make sure we don't get too in the weeds with tech chart. Yes, the fact that I am easily confused is to your benefit, listener. So I'm very excited to ask the dumb questions that hopefully lead to smart answers. That's right. We get to greater insight by working together. So let's get our conversation going with Brian Shan. For everyone listening, today's guest is Brian Shang, CEO and co-founder of Aquaria. Brian's accomplishments are impressive, especially for someone in their 20s. Wait, what? 20s? 20s? Oh, come on. At 19, he founded Fresh VC while he was still at Princeton, graduated in three years while running it all. That fund's investments resulted in companies with a total net worth of $3 billion, including two IPOs and five other companies worth $250 million. Always passionate about climate change, Brian actually wrote his Princeton thesis on renewable energy and water infrastructure. And during the pandemic, he and his brother, Eric, founded Aquaria, developing atmospheric water generators for commercial and residential use. So cool. It's clearly an area Brian believes in as he's invested several million dollars of his own, practically brute sapping the company. And we're going to learn a lot more about that. And as water crises threaten cities worldwide, innovative solutions like Aquaria's are crucial. The UN's latest report paints a grim picture of billions of people lacking safe drinking water, with the situation worsening due to climate change and growing demand. This crisis not only threatens basic needs and health, but also fuels conflict over scarce resources. Brian, welcome to the Spark of Ages. Rajiv, I'm super excited to be here. And also, it's also great to see that it's a brother duo on this podcast as well. So I'm super there excited to dive in. Brother yes. to brother. We're going to have a be. whole bunch of brothers <laughs> into it. B to B. That's what that stands yeah. for. It's also bot to bot if you're into bot the AI world. That's right. So really happy to have you here. I got to know about you from a person named Sammy Hassan. And uh, while I was at South by Southwest and I was just chatting with her, we're at one of those events talking about climate solutions. And she said, you got to talk to this guy. He has a really innovative solution that can make the world a greater place. And then she actually has done an analysis on your company and found it to be the leader amongst 20 plus companies in it. So let's start off with the basics for the audience. What are the big problems with water that you and Aquaria are trying to solve? Yeah, absolutely. But before I jump into that, you know, in case Sam is listening to this podcast, want to really give her a big shout out for connecting us. You know, but for Aquaria, I think it's it's our, our mission is very straightforward. We are safeguarding access to clean water against droughts and the effects of climate change. More specifically, I think as we talk about the effects of climate change, as we think about a sustainable transition, most of that conversation is focused around energy or carbon footprint. A lot fewer people think about our access to clean water, even though it's one of the main ways that we actually suffer from the negative effects of climate change. So that's what we're trying to do at Aquaria is that we want to use technology to offer a faster and more affordable way to provide water in a time where we're just running out of clean water everywhere. Yeah, it's amazing, right? I mean, everyone, when they think about uh, energy, they think about fuel and the carbon emissions and all the effects of it. And one of it is, it's just going to be much more difficult to deal with getting access to clean water, right? You think it's everywhere, but it's not really everywhere. Um, Were there particular events that caught your attention that helps highlight why this is such a crisis, maybe even beyond what happened at Flint or even describing what happened at Flint or what's happening in Chennai, right? Yeah. Actually, I'm a first generation immigrant from China. And actually where my grandparents grew up is a place called Jinan in Northern China. And it's also named as the city of a thousand springs. So growing up in America, you know, I used to go back to China at times and one of the major sources of attraction were these springs. And I noticed that over the years, those springs started drying up 
And nowadays, if you go there, it's unfortunate, but 20, 20 some odd years later, that it's no longer for sure that you can still visit those places. And so growing up, you know, I remember my grandparents telling me, like, this is the history and culture of, you know, where they grew up and they used to go play over there. Like, that's that's no longer available. Combine that with the fact that, you know, as I was doing my own research, I was thinking about, OK, well, where are some of the areas that, that I can make most an impact and where, you know, people are not paying as much attention to? And it occurred to me one, you know, one day when I was, I mean, I've been living in San Francisco and around the, around California for a great part of the past decade. And it's like, oh, wow, actually we have a couple million people just in California alone that don't have access to clean water. This is not just a problem around the world in developing countries or places that, you know, are farther away from us. It's a huge problem right here back at home. And so, you know, kind of these couple of data points let me to understand and start digging deeper that, wow, this, this, is, this, this is a problem that is much more pervasive and also accelerating at a much faster pace than we imagine right here in the backyards. So this is something that I can contribute to and this is something that I want to do something about. Yeah. So what do you think are the main causes? Because of climate change or is it because of urbanization or is it that lakes and reservoirs are disappearing faster or is it just poor water infrastructure? What, what do you what do you think this is? Well, I think the all causes? of those things you mentioned are causes, but I think one of the worst things about water is that it's it's not valued. Like we value every single commodity and there's a market for every commodity. And, you know, everything has a price to it, whether it's more or less efficient. And then you have water, which is completely worthless, like which makes no sense. It supports life. So it should be like the life's most precious resource. While on the other hand, water is like the cheapest commodity and nobody cares about the price of water. And, you know, because it's heavily subsidized by government utilities as something that, that must must be provided for, you know, almost as like a right of life. You know, we don't think of water as its actual value to what we need it for. And now, for the first time, it's catching up to us where we understand that some of the places where water is most necessary, like here in America, would be like Texas. It would be places like Arizona. But if you actually look at the water prices, they're some of the cheapest nationally. Which makes again no sense whatsoever. Right, so it's not even it's not even economically driven, right? It's, I used to take my son to the Central Valley to play soccer. Why, when you live in Palo Alto, would you take your kid to Central Valley to play soccer? Because they had twenty five wonderful grass fields in the middle of Central Valley. Why did they have twenty five grass fields in a hundred degree heat, which is super dry? Because water was subsidized there, because that's where all the farmland is. So there's definitely a mispricing in the market. We would go far away because that's where water was cheap, but it was actually being used sometimes in inefficient ways because it wasn't being priced well. So Brian, are you trying to take away my 40 minute shower? Rinse and repeat is an important part of the shampoo bottle. So I try to do that as much as possible. A lot of the water usage behaviors, you know, I think it all combines together. Uh, 40 minute shower. Well, if people, well, well Sandeep, if you installed a water recycling, you know, system on your house, that 40 minute shower is okay. You know, that 40 minute shower might only use 2% of what you think you might use because that water will then recycle itself, then goes back into your house uh, and, and then you can keep on using that. Your 40 minute shower is reduced to now one minute equivalent, two minute equivalent worth of shower usage. And that will be totally fine, right? But but tying that with the economic piece is that, you know, it's not just about the mismatch of pricing. It's because of the mismatch of pricing, then you sort of have a cascading chain of events where you know, there's not as many investments into improving the efficiency of water. There's not as much investment into the opportunities in water because if it doesn't make profit or it doesn't save you as much cost, it, there's not as much efficient dynamics at play to make the whole system better. I'll give you a crazy fact here. You know, right now, Mexico City is on the verge of a huge water crisis and that's been making the news a lot. But if you look at the data, Mexico City loses up to 40% of its water supply just from leaking infrastructure. Like it just leaks away. Mm. And, and that's the same thing here in the U.S., right? Same thing here in the U.S. Most of our pipes are almost 100 years old and just leaks. So they're losing their water just because of poor infrastructure. I know in um, Chennai and in Bangalore, they've been told they can't build apartments or flats or condos, homes, because uh, there's just not enough water supply to guarantee it. So over there, they use gasoline to bring water to you. They have water trucks that go and bring these things to you. Incredible. And as the, as the trucks drive by, they, they're leaking water the whole time. So it's Oh, yeah. Just I incredible. feel like it's also an issue with feedback in terms of like our water usage. It's it's not in front of your face all the time that you're you know leaking water. You have to take some sort of extra steps to like to determine whether or not 
you have leaky pipes and stuff like that. If we had, you know, sort of more systems that allowed you to see visibly that, hey, you are using this much water all the time and that you are currently leaking water, then, you know, wouldn't we be more responsive in, into solving this, you know, that problem? I, I, I agree. Again, I would say that partially this has to do with the perverse incentives here. Actually, if you go to Bolinas, you drive into Bolinas, at the front of town, there's actually this meter that tells you like, hey, this is where our water supply stands today. And you know, green, yellow, mm -hmm. orange, red. And, and, and that's because for Bolinas, water has become such a huge problem that it's like, hey, guys, we got to look at this or we're really, really, really screwed. But that's not the case for lots of other places. The incentives just aren't there. You know, like Sandeep, I would ask you, like, would you notice if your water bill went up by like, I don't know, two hundred dollars, right? Yeah, if, that's probably yes, you're right. Right. But <laughs> but by the time you notice that thing went up by two hundred dollars, it probably should have went up by like two thousand dollars. You know, the equivalent for that much yeah. energy leakage for your bill would have been an right. order of magnitude higher. So, so the economics don't work. They it's it's a broken infrastructure. But then all, with all that, the water not being valued as much, you saw an opportunity, right? And that's why you started Aquaria. Tell us about the company and what it's doing, why it's special, why it's interesting. What I am looking to build with Aquaria is unlocking a completely new source of Smart. water. If we look at history since Mesopotamia, all civilizations have always been built around physical bodies of water. And then as we advanced civilization and had additional abilities, then we built systems and networks of transportation that allowed us to move water from standing bodies to now kind of a network of distributed water, which I think, again, we are sitting on one of the biggest networks here, right here in California, right? But right. now that as we have done that, which allowed us to massively expand geographically and you know build all across all over a number of places, the problem is that with the types of water problems and the frequency of water problems arising, this model no longer works. This model is based off of this big central infrastructure that is capex heavy, and then you kind of build this big system outwards of transportation. So with Aquaria, we want to skip all over that because we think that model is not flexible enough, takes too long, and takes too much capital as well. That's not to say that that model doesn't have its use case. It's just that we need more options. And by using atmosphere mm. water generator, where air is omnipresent, we are providing a totally new option that skips over the time and capital needs and just directly place them almost anywhere, anytime. It's almost like a decentralized or distributed model of water. And that's why I see a huge opportunity. Can you take me through what this thing looks like that converts air into water? What does that look like? How do I get one? Well, if Sandy, if you like one, I'll send you one. <laughs> All you got to do is it's, host a uh... podcast. Oh my gosh, we, we solved it. Look at that. Just get Brian on your podcast. <laughs> We're going to do that for everything we want. I'm going to have a Porsche podcast. Yeah, next exactly. Week. <laughs> That's a that's a great question, you know, for all our audience members. Uh, you, you can go on our website right now. Like we're live. This is this is something we're deploying today and helping people across America get access to water. Um, you can think of us like as the Tesla battery packs of water. Like we have small units, we have big units. Our smallest unit is like an indoor unit that you just plug into the wall in your garage or on your balcony, and that unit can produce up to 24 gallons of water a day. So enough to supply all your cooking, drinking, whether it's your your home or you know office and, and whatnot. And then we have a larger unit that can link together like the mega packs or the power packs and create way larger amounts of water in the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of gallons per unit. They're just boxes, large boxes, small boxes connected to the other. Use them standalone and make So water. you can get one of these units today off their website. Um, or by you hosting a podcast. Home, or by hosting a podcast. Zero options. But I think what's interesting about it is that there's some, there's some interesting technology that you've put into this. There's 20 other companies doing atmospheric water generation, doing something where they're uh, using a desiccant. Right, which is you know like those little packs you get inside your, in you know when you oh, get yeah, the suitcase or briefcase, those little silica packs. Yeah. Or you're doing kind of like a dehumidifier, like an air conditioner. But is that is it that, or is it something even more interesting, or even special about how it all comes together? I think it's all of the above and even more. You know, there's many different techniques to get water out of there. The analogy I like to make is like you're building a high performance car, and there's a variety of different ways that you can do that. At least the the first step, just the first step alone, requires you to do all of the above, such as reducing the weight of the car, 
building a more powerful engine, designing the shape of the car so that it's aerodynamically sound. And that encompasses what our core technology is composed of, is we've built special high thermoconductive materials, we've built heat exchange and recovery systems, uh, and we've designed the, the uh, airflow and the fluid dynamics of how we actually capture and condense the air in the machine as it flows through the internal workings of the machine, so that all of it is for the purpose of maximizing active or passive heat exchange, which results in maximum water capture. And so that's just in step one of what we have built. And in that first step, it's already involved material science. It's already involved condensation heat exchange. It's already involved in mechanical design for aerodynamic uh, water capture. So all of that encompasses step one. And as we think about furthering along, it's like, again, keep on pushing additional techniques that allows us to build this more higher performance car core. One of the interesting parts about uh, what you're doing at Aquaria, right, is that it's a it's a system dynamics solution, as you as you talked about, right, where you're combining multiple technologies together, multiple techniques. So there's a lot more to it that enables you to get. I think a 25 percent is a minimum level of humidity, which is actually well suited to many many to most locations around the world, except for maybe the the Phoenix Desert in the summer. Uh, but everywhere else in the world is is possible. Like you have units that can produce either small or at scale. And the cool part about it is you can move those units around, which a lot of systems can't do, right? They're, they're usually just fixed in one place, whereas you guys can move it around, which has a, a tremendous potential. Yeah, absolutely. When we first started looking at developing the Aquaria system, I took a very practical approach in thinking through, well, what are the different approaches? What are the pros and cons of each approach? Like, for example, there are great research teams at many universities around the world that are doing some type of atmospheric water capture research like Berkeley and with Professor Yagi or Ken Abdullah University in, in, this, um, in the Middle East. And, and, and there are pros and cons to each approach. For example, with desiccant materials, while you can make, let's say, X gallons of water per cubic meter, there are some scaling factors that doesn't allow it to scale you know, infinitely or as, as, as high volume as possible. So when we think about what Aquaria is trying to do, there are two key metrics. And our guiding North Star KPIs are, you know, what is the highest water of production density we can achieve and what is the highest energy efficiency that we can produce that at so that you know ultimately as we continue to build out of the company and scale our technology one day that we can power entire cities with energy from the sun and then water from the sky and and that's how we think about combining these different techniques so that we can achieve those results okay this is this sounds awesome and run up my i mean i want to wear it like a backpack at this point um and hike around i'm just curious about who so right now who is who is like your customer profile like who's buying this how much does it cost what's your sort of cost analysis for aquarius solution it's it sounds really expensive i'm running like this uh really efficient air conditioner all the time. I'm, I'm going to be spending a lot of money, ain't I? Yeah. So right now, our product starts at three thousand dollars. Wow, that's actually pretty reasonable. I, I think three thousand dollars right now, we can pay back our unit anywhere from. I guess it depends on how many people drink water from it. Like, uh, you know, for one of my investors who put it in their office, I think we gave them a payback on their, you know, water delivery service in like sixty days or something like that. But if you're using it in your home probably takes a bit longer, maybe a year to a year and a half, because you're you're probably today going to Costco and buying mineral water or bottled water, I would assume, depending on what you're consuming. So then you can pay back that calculation just because our water is being produced at a couple pennies per gallon, um, per, uh, depending on where you're at. And then for our larger units, our customers for our, for, for, for our, our systems are primarily builders developers, homeowners, like building owners, because it's the building owners, Rajiv, like you mentioned that in, in Chennai, I think you mentioned that apartments and condos and buildings and all can be built. Actually, those are our same customers in the US. It's developers and builders that need to secure a water supply and we're providing that option. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. I think one of the points of it, I'll just, by the way, I'm being playful about the expensive costs. So uh, <laughs> I did a little bit of math. So here's a math lesson. From what I read, the average person uses between 60 to 100 gallons a day, notwithstanding Sunday's 40 minute showers. <laughs> so it takes a while uh, to look this good, is all I'm saying. So that, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. If they buy one of your 250 gallon units. I think that uses 11 kilowatts, from what I understand, looking at your site. 
And uh, at the Palo Alto energy rate, which is higher than most of the nation, that's 22 cents per kilowatt hour. That cost me $2.42. Hmm. That's my math. Okay, so, not bad. so I mean, it's, it's kind of like you're doing, it's almost like a solar panel calculation, you know, when like people are deciding, huh, should I get solar or not? And it's like, oh, oh, this will pay itself off in 15 months kind of a thing. Actually, I would say that it's not no. quite, the, quite the same yet, because I would say that, you know, it's going to be dependent on where you are in the country. Because, for example, if you currently right. already have right a stable and clean tap water connection, like if you live in New York or San Francisco, that water is actually quite cheap. It's actually quite cheap. Where we really make economic sense is in, you know, areas of the country, which could be at just one hour north of San Francisco, where there's actually significant water problems. It could be contamination. It could be other types of problems. And so you're you're spending money on things like digging a well or, or other things that is apart from you, your municipal water. And that's where our cost calculations come in that we could justify that. I, I think the, the San Francisco and New Yorks of the world do have pretty good and clean and cheap water. And so in these places, it's just probably that the calculation will be against bottled water or mineral water with that cost. Right. So I, I think this is this is part of your go to market, right? And your market targeting. Uh, which I'd love to learn more about. So if you're in San Francisco and you have, you know, Hetch Hetchy water, right? Stuff that comes from the from the Sierras, we've already piped it, created it, created all these reservoirs. We've already paid all the upfront costs. We're getting it at fairly low cost. So you probably aren't going to pay for watering your lawn or growing your crops using your technology. But you are in maybe some places in Central Valley where the water's not clean. You know, there's lead pipes or contaminated water sources or all these places where you can't build where this is really interesting, or maybe there's just places like, I think you guys have one in Hawaii where it's too difficult to put up a plant. Exactly. And I think of it as like a, you know, like a pyramid of value proposition, right? Like everybody needs water. People need water. You know, animals need water. Plants need water. Everything needs water. (laughs) So then, but then the water being supplied to different people or targets at different areas at their respective order of value. And so we're starting off with the highest value areas and the highest value problems, especially in a world where, you know, renewable energy is getting cheaper and cheaper, if not super, super affordable. Then we start off there. And as we continue to decrease the cost of this technology, then we're able to move down a chain and offer it to more and more people, starting with today, bottled water, anywhere that uses packaged water, we are already cheaper than and then anywhere that's trying to build infrastructure, we're also faster and cheaper than those alternative infrastructure. Now, of course, uh, you're talking to a marketer, right? And I really care about go to market. So when you're thinking about, you know, you've put your own money into this, right? And you're also raising uh, capital. What do you think about as your go to market strategy? Like, who are you focusing on first? You have home units, you have good, bigger size residential units, you have much larger ones for commercial. Where do you put your energy and how do you sell? Yeah, so right now our primary focus is on actually working with uh, residential builders. Um, they have, they're either building new communities or they have existing communities that they manage um, where these are folks that have both the budget and the desire to change something about the water supply. What I've learned is that I will never, I can't say never, but it's just like an impossible task to convince somebody who doesn't think they have a water problem that they need water. Like you should know that you have a water problem. If you don't, then this is not somebody that we want to be selling to. So we're not ever out there trying to convince you that you have a water problem. In fact, right now, most of the customers are coming to us where they're finding us like, for example, through Google or through the content that we're publishing or through, um, you know, Instagram and LinkedIn, where we're saying, hey, you experience water challenges of these types. And perhaps these are some of the solutions you're looking at. Here's what it might look like with Aquarius generators instead. And that's also something that we want to expand upon and be even more detailed in our go to market with these residential communities. And so, you know, Rajiv, I'd love to, you know, I was looking at your, your website as well. You know, I would love to like maybe explore that further, how we can get better with our messaging. Oh, great. Nice. See, apparently the podcast has a demand generation capability. So. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's what, what you're doing, Brian, right? You're, you're basically, by putting content out there about you folks, people are finding you and then they, they reach out to you. Do you actually 
create lists of different home builders and reach and that are going to various communities and reach out to them via maybe email or phone calls or that kind of thing? Is that how you get people in? You know, it's funny. We're just starting to do that now. Like up until maybe a month ago where we have been in the process of closing our latest round of financing, the entire company has been engineers and product folks, you know, us making sure we can build a technology that can do what we say it will do. So since we launched the company in public and, and started selling to customers, everything has been inbound. We have not done any outbound. We've barely done marketing. Wow. You know, in fact, our website barely ranks on Google, you know, and like, you know, we just didn't do much at all. We were just building products. And so now we're like in the secondary phase where, you know, this summer is essentially the hottest summer since I started this company. And so there's like droughts everywhere and, and it's like the right time for us now to do that. Like that's what we're trying to do now is to be public, be out there and get in front of the builders as well. That's really smart. Great to hear that uh, you're actually pulling demand and you're getting these um, proof of concept projects like the one in Hawaii, a thousand, thousand person units. I could definitely see if I'm putting up a warehouse in the middle of nowhere and I don't have the initial infrastructure there, I'd probably bring that with my construction crew. I can see lots of you know really interesting uses. Um, for, for your, your product and technology. Let's talk about background and where you came from and what drives you. You decided to take on climate change and you decided to focus on water security and resiliency, right? And so if you're successful, you'll be able to make a big impact on the world. So was there a day when this just totally clicked to you that said, oh, I'm going to commit to this? There was, although I think the tie-in isn't exactly to climate change specifically. You know, like I started Aquaria four years ago, but um, I was running another company fresh before that that was focused on impact related or, you know, venture investment. So I guess there are ties in there, but it's not as if one day I, or in my whole life, I was passionate about water. I think what really is the driving motivation for me is, is more of like my growing up experience. I think I mentioned earlier, I grew up in New York as a first generation uh, you know, American and my parents immigrated here essentially to give my, my my family a better life, to build a better future for us. And so, you know, I, my parents went through a lot to be able to do that. And so I won't go into the details, but it's 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 a little crazy, you know, pretty crazy story. <laughs> we feel you. For, for first gen love, first gen love over here. I mean, I love the first gen love. Yeah. My, my dad, my dad came to America with negative eleven thousand dollars in his pocket. He had to. <laughs> He had to take loans from his family, from other family members to be able to come to the U.S. and go to college. So, yeah. Fun. And I know in talking with you earlier, your family had its own situation. But help me with the connection of, I mean, I, I hear that, you know, the, the parental struggle, right? Coming across the world to a whole new universe to then raise your kids away entirely away from the culture that you know. How does that connect to your desire for wanting to make sure that nobody goes thirsty? Help me connect the dots on that. Yeah. So to me, you know, I, I, in a way, if I look at my own, you know, growing up experience from a third, third party angle, I almost think that perhaps money would have been the motivation, given that we came from an immigrant family. But the thing was, I never felt that we like I wasn't taken care of. And the reason that happened was because, you know, my, my, my father and my parents gave up so much of their own well being to ensure that, you know, I grew up with without having the burden of, uh, of anything, really. I, I felt that I was like the luckiest kid growing up. I felt like I was well taken care of. I did not feel like I was different from any of the kids I grew up with, which was, you know, kind of like pretty, uh, you know, relatively wealthy part of Long Island. It was only later on in life I realized like just truly how much that, you know, that sacrifice happened in order to make sure that we, we had a better life. And that really drove me to understand that like, okay, I'm not here to just get a job. I'm not here to like just do some, you know, normal nine to five. Like I want to do something that is, that channels that same energy for the people around me, whether that's my friends or, or, or the people I love or, or my parents or whoever it is that I can build a better future that I can be proud of for everyone else, for myself and, 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 and continue to do that. And so that has, I think, reflected itself in, you know, whatever it is that I have done, whether it's investment, whether it's building this company. And, and I think it's that purpose, that, that, that motivation that I saw in building my first company and now also in building Aquaria as well. I can definitely see that with, um, like I was thinking before even this call, I was sitting there going, why as a VC would you start a company that does hardware, right? Because as you know, right, hardware's, you got you to gotta 
make stuff, you got distribution, you got supplies, you got to put it in a place, you got to send it out where software, you could just, you know, you have a high, super high gross margins. It's all your code. And maybe, maybe it's, is it your background from fresh, um, from looking at impact that kind of drove you to do something as complicated as this or as complex as this and interesting? I'm a mission driven founder. To me, the specific, I don't think, I think it's difficult to build any kind of business. You know whether it's software or hardware i would i would turn it up turn it around and say that if you're building a climate company and you don't have differentiated hardware you know software is kind of useless i could dig into the business and i can you know kind of turn the business logic different ways that we can debate about it but starting this business has always been about the mission part for me and what i can do there and the intricacies of building that business is difficult no matter how you look at it and so starting this business is really coming from somewhere more internally driven. And it just also lined up that when I thought about the opportunities here, whether from an impact angle or just from the just absolute need for innovating in water, all of those things aligned. And I couldn't think of anything else I would rather be spending my time on. That's amazing. And you decided to bootstrap this instead of going to your early investors or maybe folks that you knew in the, in, in the industry. Is it because were you trying to prove it first before you, before you went out and took investment? Is that kind of the thinking behind it? You no, know, I started this company at the beginning of the pandemic, slightly before the beginning of the pandemic. I was on this global tour and then the pandemic happened. So the whole world kind of went upside down. It was kind of like, okay, well, let's wait for things to settle and call my friends and see, you know, all the VCs I know and see, which I did. But the reception was like, everyone was chaotic and yeah, it was a mess. It was a mess. Time. It was a total, total mess. mess. It was a total mess. Yeah. So <laughs> somewhere along the way, I was like, well, it's me or wait it out and, and depend on somebody else. And of course, you know, that's basically the route I settled on is, is, you know, well, I think the most efficient way for to do this is to do it my way and to double down on it. I don't know how long it would take to convince, uh, you know, outsiders to build this in a time where a 100 year, once in a 100 year event has just happened, the, well, like maybe the world will be locked down for five years. Who, who the hell knows? Otherwise, right, let's, yeah. let's do this. Yeah, you're wait, yeah. yeah, you wanted to p push the chips in. It sounds like you, rather than waiting the waiting for the world to unmess itself before you can get VC funding, you're like, let's go build the that. thing that I want to build. That's, that's yeah, awesome. Apparently, apparently, Brian, you have a lot of impatience. I mean, you finished college in three years. You started a business while you're in college. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, yeah, I noted before when he was like, you know, I know, I noticed in la later in life when, and later in life, and I was like, what was that when you were like seventeen? Is that later in life for you, Brian? <laughs> um, he's, he's in a rush to make great things happen. Uh, I don't know what to say now. Now I'm stumped. I, uh, I, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm stumped. oh, good. Well, I'm glad you're stumped because, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt to to stump you even more because what's gonna happen next? This next segment is called the spark tank and you are going to go into my gaming arena two ceos enter and one gets the golden parachute today's challenge oh. is gonna be <laughs> gonna be all about off the grid living i thought that was kind of a oh, cool okay. sort of uh, semi-tangential <laughs> uh, thing to to you know aquaria here you know we've got a thrilling matchup today folks in the audience between Brian Shang, the man who can turn air into water. He's a real life waterbender for all my avatar friends out there against my very own brother, Rajiv Parikh, the CEO of a marketing company who let's be honest, the closest he's come to roughing it is losing cell phone service at the Ritz in Bali. No! Yeah, no! yeah. It was a rough, it was a, it was a rough, it was a rough couple hours for him. Uh, it, hurts, it hurts just thinking about it. Yeah. All right. We're, here's, here's how this is going to Brian. We're going to do three rounds of truth. Two, two truths and a lie where I'm going to list off three interesting factoids about off the grid living and you must determine which one is a lie. All right. So both of you are going to lock in your answers. I'm going to try this new, we're going to try this new style here. I'm going to count down three, two, one, and you're going to raise your fingers one, two, or three to lock you in to your answer oh, as I to which it. one's we can't a lie. Cheat. Exactly. We can't none cheat. of this, none of this listening to what the last guy said and then yeah. go, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Here's round one. If you're going to go living off the grid, you're going you're to need some means to make energy and food, right? So round one is all about that. Okay. Number one, you can create a battery using soil and living plants, specifically using what a plant secretes during photosynthesis 
for off-grid energy. And number two, some off-grid communities use giant hamster wheels as a fun way for children and or pets to generate electricity. Number three, some survivalists are able to grow their own mushrooms <clears throat> of all varieties <laughs> uh, using old paperback books and coffee grounds. Okay, so that's one, two, and three. Number one is the battery from soil plants. Number two is the giant hamster wheel. Number three is mushrooms in a book. On the count of three, I want to see your fingers. One, two, oh, and three. Oh, boy. <laughs> three, two, one. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so Brian, you said number one, the battery from soil and living plants is, is malarkey. Rajiv, you said the giant hamster wheel is no go. Well, guess what? My brother, in fact, gets the point here. It turns out, yes, I don't think giant hamster wheels do the job. Yeah, I, I know the, this, this battery from living soil and plants was a surprise to me. It's called plant microbial fuel cell. Okay, this is Plant MFC. It's a bioenergy technology that was demonstrated at Wageningen University in the Netherlands in 2014. In the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. Netherlands. And uh, it, it's pretty wild. It generates electricity by capturing electrons released by soil microbes as they break down organic matter. Pretty, pretty I was thinking. I was thinking that exactly. Yeah, I'm sure you were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how you power your Tesla. You keep it so yeah, exactly. Keep it so cheap. Um, Very cool. Yeah. All right. Pretty wild. And yes, you can also grow mushrooms in paperback books, preferably da old Daniel St <laughs> Steele novels. They have to be Please, they have to be yes. cheesy romance novels. Um, Fabio It has to have Fabio <laughs> on the cover. There was actually a really cool coffee company, co mushroom company that I remember that did that. They like grew mushrooms in coffee. They like they were like an organic mushroom company or something where they grew like. High end yeah. mushrooms using oh, wow. the waste coffee grinds from like right. uh, as a uh, from, from just random Perfect. coffee company. But I actually thought the hamster wheel thing was 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 real. You know, like people just doing that as a pet project or something like that. Um. I know, I know. I, 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 sounds like I was a tempted. Exercise. I was tempted. I was tempted. Let's see if you can make it up in round two. Let's try to tie the game here. All right, number two. This is all about people that have successfully lived off the grid. <clears throat> Number one, a man from Sweden has lived off the grid for over 30 years in a home that he built inside a giant rock using natural spring for water and solar panels for electricity. Number two, a woman in New Zealand lives in a tree house powered entirely by a bicycle generator, which she pedals for two hours daily to meet all of her energy needs. Okay. Number three, a couple in Canada lives off grid in a floating home made of recycled materials using a wood stove for heating and growing vegetables in a rooftop garden. All right. So is it one, the Swedish man in the rock? Number two, the New Zealander in the treehouse? Or number three, the Canadians floating on a boat? Here we Wait, go. So what's, the, what's the last one? Yeah. He's floating on the boat. Floating on a boat made of recycled materials using a wood stove for heating and growing vegetables in a rooftop garden. Wow, this is a close one. Ready? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Here we go. Three... <laughs> Two, one. Okay, great. I love that you both have different answers. That's really yes. helpful. All right. Turns out, so Rajiv, you said number two, correct? Three. And, oh, you said number three. And, okay. And Brian, you said number two. And guess what? Brian is correct. So you have tied the game up. That's right. The woman ah. in the treehouse is not, there's no There's no Ewoks in New Zealand that live off of pedal pedal bikes it turns out sadly uh, uh yeah yeah you thought that it was, should have been easy yeah you thought it was three no there is actually a couple in canada and in fact wow, their floating home is anchored in a remote <laughs> lake and they commute to a nearest town by canoe oh, isn't that yeah. very lovely eh it's very nice, eh? <laughs> very romantic that's crazy uh, wow it is romantic it is romantic See, they, but that doesn't count because they go back to the island they go to the island che they cheat every day they don't live totally on the water uh, that's what i was counting on well, you know, th but they, that can't work. We'll get, we'll get into the definition of off the grid later. Okay. He's faux off the grid. Yeah. He's going back and having a beer. No, but the, home, the home is off the grid. Okay. Anyway. Uh, All right. Round number three. It doesn't mean they're like low. They're not hermits. <laughs> they can still like visit that, towns. That, that's what off, no, that, that's like, what off the grid they, means. They get their own power and their own water and their own sources oh, of food okay. and stuff. They don't. Okay. Sure, sure. All right. Round number three. Here we go. These are uh, about the structures themselves. There's some interesting 
structures out there that people live in. All right, so number one, there is an off-the-grid home that can be folded up and moved like a suitcase. These are foldable homes or tiny portable houses, and they're a modern innovation. So uh, is that true? Let's right. find out. Number two, some off-grid homes are built entirely from recycled airplane fuselages, offering both durability and a unique aesthetic, to say the least. Number three, an off-grid community in New Mexico lives in, a, in homes made entirely of discarded glass bottles and concrete, creating colorful and insulating walls. All right, lock in your answers mentally, and I'll count down. Here we go. Three, two, one. Let's see it. Guess what? Rajiv guessed number one, the foldable home is false, and Brian said number three, the off-grid community in New Mexico is false. I'm so sorry. But you're it's both too. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of you gets the golden parachute. Um, you guys are stuck in the arena. We <laughs> failed together. Oh, man. <laughs> it turns out the airplane fuselages were full of it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can get a suitcase home, it turns out. So, uh, yeah, I could see that. I thought glass would be n- yeah. non insulating. So, I thought that would be I, thought, I figured doing the toilet and the sink would be tough in that home, but I oh. guess not. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. just a box. Mm-hmm. The home is just a box. Yeah, as a consolation prize, um, we'll, I'll be sending both of you a foldable home that you must live in now. Um, so I want to do that tonight. Yeah, you're getting kicked out of your actual houses. Sleep in my back backyard. <laughs> All right, so we end in a kissing your sister or kissing your brother tie here. So well played, though. Well played, guys. You know, sometimes it's it's best to be on equal footing. There you go. It happens. Usually, usually we give the tie to the guest, but not today. So. So anyway, well, well, we'll give the tie to the guest. Okay, all right, we give the tie to the guest. Sure. So, Brian, right. hey, congratulations, you're the winner. You get both portable homes. Yeah. You're so kind. Great. You're so kind to come here. Brian, uh, you founded this company with your brother uh, Eric, right? And it's always interesting to start a company with your family member. Um, yeah, really it interesting. Worked out? It's very interesting to start anything—a podcast, a company. I mean, podcast, you know, it could be anything. Good lord! But I mean, you're really tied together. Like, I only have to do this. I only have to see somebody once every, <laughs> you know, week or two. But you actually have to see him possibly every other day, and your financial fortunes are tied together. What is it like? Any any interesting stories? I think the most interesting story that I can think of is actually um, when. Uh, my co-founder and brother Eric and I went on this, um, you know, those like uh, Silicon Valley type of like meditation retreats for founders. You go deep into the mountains and you like, kind of like talk about a lot of different problems and you know, like they, they do this a lot. And, you know, I, it's probably on a s- episode yeah, you, of l- l- Silicon, yeah. no, no mushrooms, but actually it was solar powered in the mountains of Mendocino. We, we were in the mountains and we had this exercise that was guided by a like a founder coach and we weren't the only ones there. There were a bunch of other early stage founding teams. And the topic of discussion was, okay, well, like um, one of the biggest problems for early stage startups is that they just simply die because the co-founders fight with each other. There's disagreements. And, you know, that's like a, that's a huge problem for earlier stage companies. And so we had this exercise where our coach essentially said, hey, all of you go and talk with each other and kind of discover, you know, and, and talk through. Like what happened if you guys have arguments or, you know, what happened, you know, if, if things don't work out and, and kind of talk to that situation. And for that exercise and only that exercise, because we've been there for like three days doing all these intense exercises. My, my brother and I, we kind of just looked at each other. We're like, I don't think there's anything for us to talk about. Like we've fought our entire lives. Wow. We've like done so many things together. And it's kind of like, yeah, that won't happen. Like we're in this, we're committed, we're, we're, we're more committed than anyone. And there's no case that this will happen at all. And I think that was the coolest experience for me. And like, I was just like, yep, we're going to chill for 10 minutes because we know the answer to that. And that moment was really like a, 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 a core memory of my founding this company. It's like, we got this and nobody else in this moment. room got this like we do. And, and I think that will, will be something I remember forever. And of course, that's built off of years and years of doing other projects, killing each other off. But like, you know, that's something very, very yeah. great for so, me. So you know every bit about each other, and so you can, you can, and you've worked through enough of it so that this business marriage can complement the the 
per- close personal relationships. And so that's awesome. So one thing I, w- I want to ask during our digging, uh, we found out that you, you know, you have ADHD, that you're diagnosed with ADHD as someone who is undiagnosed ADHD. I am wondering, you know, at, you know, as a CEO, you're pulled in to- so many different directions at, at a time. How, how have you worked, managed through that? How, you know, any specific t- tips you maybe would offer to our listeners or, or me? <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think a lot of pe- everyone has their own particular version of it. I've found that finding a routine that works for me and then finding a person to actually, uh, so like I would say, like I work very closely with, um, you know, a, a chief of staff to help me manage and help me sit down and think through and complement the gaps in my like lack of focus, but then also finding the type of activities that allows me in this particular case, like I've really gotten into taking um, like walks and, and ice baths that, that helps me calm down my nervous system, but then baking that into like a series of routines, you know, plus external help. Um, those two things have really helped me. Nice. So it's like an accountability buddy. And then these sort of these like sort of nervous system, yeah, um, calming routines. I love it. Yeah. Also, Sandeep, I've also found that actually the exact opposite is also really helpful. It's like incredibly, like intensely structured. Like yes. Thirty minutes, fifteen minutes by fifty. Like to have a so structure that you don't have room to think, and you just go like mm. one by one and execute. And I found that that actually counterintuitive also helps me stay focused is just be just be doing things the whole time one one by one one by one and let it it go with whatever flow works for you as opposed to the perfect structure yeah one question we love to ask uh, founders of companies is uh, who or what historical event really motivated you or was it an event or person or who inspires you I, i would say my single source of inspiration is definitely my father you know, he was an entrepreneur as well. He was raised during the time of Chinese Cultural Revolution, where you know you got beat up and you got, you know, you, you got negative types of attention for for being entrepreneurial and smart and speaking out. And and then he he took us all here to America. And and you know now I think about it as like how crazy it is that I'm able to do this today because of all of the work that you know my father has done to bring me here and all of the adversity to bring me here and to be the person i am today so yeah so i, I would say you know that that really wraps it as a shout out to my dad you know for everything he's done for me and uh you know that's definitely my and it will continue to be you know my source of motivation that's really awesome well brian uh i think with that yeah uh, that's the best way to end it i love what you're doing i love what you're building i love how you're doing it and uh i really hope and uh, really want to see you go out there and re- change the world for everyone and enable us all to get to live better lives, have safe, clean drinking water. And um, it affects the health and the lives of so many people. So I really appreciate what you're trying to do and what you're trying to create. So uh, may everybody win, including um, your customers, uh, you and your investors. I hope everybody wins. And I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. And, and I really want to thank you, Regina and Sandy, for hosting me, giving me this opportunity to be on the podcast. And uh, I hope I hope that you know the audience found this to be an interesting and fun episode. Thank you again. All right, awesome. well, thanks, thanks Brian. Yep. Next time I see you, we're, we're gonna get a drink. Let's do it. Of water. <laughs> <laughs> I think the next line extension is a beer making machine. Yeah. <laughs>
if my father is going to go through so much to get me here to America and do so much to sacrifice to provide me a great life, then I got to pay back to the world, not just yeah, the, the pay it forward mentality. Yeah, I, not just make a whole bunch of money, but actually make great change. And he's doing it. Today. It's like the opposite of entitlement, this pay it forward attitude, this attitude of uh, I, I am privileged because of the sacrifice. I think that's the beauty of first generation specifically that's is right. that you really do get a visceral sense of the sacrifice because you see you can really clearly see the market change between where they came from and where they are, you know, whenever we go back to India and stuff like that. And so you can see, wow, they went many, many degrees. All right. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this pod, please take a moment to rate it and comment. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts can be found. Hey, this show is produced by moi, Cindy Parik, and Anand Shah. Production assistance by Taryn Talley and edited by Sean Marr and Aiden McGarvey. I'm your host, Rajiv Parikh from Position Squared, a kick-ass growth marketing company based in Silicon Valley. Come visit us at Position2.com. This has been an effing funny production. We'll catch you next time. Remember, folks, be ever curious.